It's in Gap Land. My name is Michael Gralia. Today is Thursday, July 11th, and this is episode 145 of Singap 10, the Singap 1 podcast. You know, I recorded this a few times last night, and I, I couldn't quite get it right. And I woke up this morning, I'm like, maybe I should simplify the story, because this is pretty complicated stuff. And you're like, you know what? I'm not going to simplify the story. This stuff is complicated. As SRF grows and evolves, stuff gets more complicated. I'm just going to lay it out for people. I'm pretty sure parents of Singapians are smart, and they can keep up. So I'm just going to tell you guys what's going on. I'm calling this podcast a tale of three grants because there's three grants that are on my mind. Actually, this week we announced a grant to the Quadrato Lab and we also shared a paper from the Anderson Lab. So there are really two grants on my mind, but you can't talk about the Quadrato grant without the COBA grant. So that's how I get to three. Let's talk about COBA. 2020, four years ago, we met Dr. COBA and Dr. COBA was really interested in Syngap. He said, well, would you guys give me some patient samples so I can work on them? So we gave him patient samples. We're very excited because he's working on IPSCs. As a reminder, I've talked about this before. You can't take a sample out of the brain. If you had a liver disease or a bone disease or a whatever disease, you could take a sample and work on that sample, but you can't take a sample from the brain. So how do we work on the brain? We take blood, we put it in reverse and we send it back to stem cells, which everything started as stem cell, right? And then we tell those stem cells to grow into neurons. By the way, that takes like six months. But once you've done that, once you've made the stem cells, those stem cells are immortal and reproducible, which means you can make a bunch of them. Then you can share them with a bunch of labs, you can grow them into neurons. And that's what Dr. Koba was doing. And this was 2020. This was early days for SRF. We were thrilled. We were great. We're happy to work with him. And he kept working. And he kept collecting samples. And he called. He said, hey, you guys, it's getting complicated. I've got some cool stuff. Will you support our work? And we were very happy to do so. We did. Since then, Dr. Koba has continued to build a, a really remarkable collection of, of IPSCs. He's worked with other scientists very collaboratively and is a co-author on some papers. And he keeps telling me how much cool stuff he's got and he's working on publications. And I keep saying, where are the publications? And he keeps saying, oh, I just got more data. And I said, stop making more data. Start writing papers, please. I'm on bended knee here. So we love Dr. Koba and um, we're, we're, we're glad we're working with him and we can't wait to read his papers. Two years after we gave Dr. Koba the grant, we got a call from Dr. Quadrado. Dr. Quadrado works down the hall from Dr. Koba, and she said, you know, I've been working with Dr. Koba's cell lines, and I've started making some organoids. And I was ex I was already happy. because or So here's the deal. Blood, cell line, cell line, grow into neurons, do, do research. Very cool. If you let those neurons grow and proliferate and connect, then you have what normal people call mini brains, little collections of neurons in a dish. Scientists call them organoids or organelles or whatever. Think mini brains. And mini brains are incredibly expensive. They take forever because you got to go from blood to, to stem cells to neurons to or, you got to let them grow. It takes forever. And because of the good work of Dr. Koba and his incre incredibly collaborative nature and Dr. Quadrado's incredibly collaborative nature, they started talking and they started working on organoids. And she called me up and she said, look, I've made some Syngap organoids. We have some interesting findings. We're going to release a paper. By the way, we'd spent zero dollars at this point. I was ecstatic. I said, this is amazing. And she said, we, now we want to do more. So will you give us a grant? And we said, this is a great idea. And we went to the board and, and basically we said, look at how much they learned from one organoid. Let's fund them to do a few more organoids to really understand how diverse the findings will be. Because remember, these, the reason we, we get excited about mice and cell lines and organoids is because they're proxies for studying the humans behind them, right? So we learned something from this one organoid. Let's look at how different the results are from these other organoids, much as the humans are different. So we gave Dr. Quadrado a grant and, and the preprint came, that came out and we gave her the grant in 2022, which I will admit was two years ago. And, and she submitted a preprint to BioArchive in May 2022. And that preprint was turned into a paper, I think, late last year. So a year and a half, the preprint was stuck in preprint land. So basically when a scientist finishes, thinks they finished a paper, they submit it as a preprint and they submit it to a journal. The preprint is there so other scientists can look at it, but then the peer review process gets it into a journal, right? This peer review process, because the work was so cutting edge, involved the reviewers coming back and saying, what about this? What about this? Why don't you do this? Why don't you add this? And, and Dr. Quadrado and Dr. Bertelli and Dr. Deloso all did that work, making it an even better paper. It was already a great paper. They made it an even better paper. And that paper came out last year. And we said, okay, now let's put out the press release. Of course, that went on the list of press releases, which is still like 10 long. And only now, seven months later, have I actually released the press release. But we're very excited to release the press release. And one of the reasons I, I did it instead of just giving up and being like, well, I'm not going to do this. First of all, it's important to have a historical record for why we did these grants, right? And so these press releases are exactly that. But also, 
I happen to know about a few other things that are happening in that grant that I'm not going to talk about right now, but are super exciting. And I will tell you, the COBRA grant was a win. We met a great person. He did great work. He's still doing great work. And he helped us meet Dr. Quadrado, and she was able to build on his work. And now we have Dr. Quadrado, Dr. D- Dr. Bertelli, I think Dr. Deloso, or maybe she's gone to another lab, I've lost track, working on more Syngap organoids. So more to come there, and really excited to see where this train is going. And congratulations to the Quadrado Lab for all of your incredible hard work. We're, we're really, really grateful. So that was one of the announcements we made this week. Complete thought on Grants 1 and 2, Coba and Quadrado. Let's talk about Grant 3 that we shared a paper out of the Anderson Lab. And if you read that paper and if you read that press release, you would be justified in calling me and saying, Mike, what are we doing about this? This this is super exciting. And a few of you have done that. Kudos to you. I know that you've actually read the, read the assignment. For those of you who haven't read it, let me point you to a few things. Um, there's a webinar where Dr. Anderson talked about his work. He did that with us a little while ago. Um, there is our announcement, which I which I shared as just a LinkedIn tile in in the in the um, show notes. And there's also a paper from Angelman. So let me tell you the, the Joe Anderson story. Joe Anderson called us in 2022. He said, "Hey, see that cool thing I did where we found a potential therapy for Angelman? I think we could do the same thing for Singap. Will you support it?" And we said, "Yeah, we'd love to support it. That sounds really interesting." And I happened to be going to an Angelman conference. I said to the Angelman people, "I said, hey, what do you guys think of Joe Anderson?" They said, "We love Joe Anderson. Very exciting work. Super cool." As far as I'm concerned, the Angelman people are really, really smart and, and really, really pushing the envelope. So we had Joe Anderson calling us. We had Angelman saying, we love this guy and we think this is really promising. We went to the board. The board said, yes, we funded the work. And what was the work? The work was basically um, using a lentiviral gene therapy applied to bone marrow to make more Singa, right? So you remember the classic story, right? We have a good copy, a bad copy. Bad copy doesn't do any work. We need the good copy to work harder. The answer in Joe Anderson's model of this, of this gene therapy, we, just, we have a good copy and a bad copy. Bad copy doesn't work. We, doesn't, we don't have enough. Let's do a bone marrow transplant and make the bones make more Syngap. Pretty crazy, kind of cool. We said, that sounds pretty crazy, kind of cool. Go watch the webinar. And he said, yeah, but you know, we've been doing this to kids forever. We've been doing bone marrow transplants and bone marrow treatments for a really long time. It's not as crazy as it sounds, and it could work. Give me a grant and we'll we'll fund the work in mice. And we said, okay, let's do this. Let's do this. Angelman's doing this. We're doing this. We're going to be on the cutting edge. That's the point, right? We're trying to push ourselves into the future. We're trying to make sure we get every therapeutic approach possible for our kids. That was their mindset. So good news. If you read the paper, we were able to cure, we, we did it, right? We, we did these little experiments on mice and we show that we were able to make the mice's bones make more Syngap. Crazy. Wonderful. Well, why aren't we rolling it into humans? Well, as Dr. Anderson was doing this good work, what we, what we learned is that the promoter here has, is a bit problematic. So I, I, one of the things I, I'd spent some time trying to think about before this web was this uh, podcast was how I'm going to explain the promoter. And, and the way to think about it is the, the, the lentiviral, the gene therapy is, is like a recipe in a cookbook, right? Like the, the gene we're going to deliver is, is in that medicine that we're going to stick in the bone. But you need a promoter to, 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 to open the recipe book to make the extra genes. And the promoter is like the chef, right? So if the medicine, if, if, the, if, the, if the gene, this is a really terrible analogy, but it's good enough. If the gene therapy is, is the recipe, and the extra genes are the product of the recipe, then the promoter is the chef who uses the recipe, right? So you have a promoter, you have a, a, a specific gene, which would be the Syngap gene in this case, and then you, you do the bone marrow thing, you stick all that in the bone, and then you make more, more Syngap. This is, this, is, this is, I'm not making this up, this is real. But this promoter, this chef, can make a lot of different recipes. And this promoter had been used in other medicines because it was pretty standard promoter is why Dr. Anderson used it. And unfortunately, we saw in some of those other medicines that, um, and by we, I mean the FDA, that this promoter caused some problems. And I will point you in the press release to the Transformatics Biotherapeutics LLC press release here. So Transformatics Biotherapeutics is a creation of the Angelman Syndrome Foundation, also known as the Foundation for Angelman Syndrome Therapy. There's two organizations and their names are very similar. It's very confusing. But I'm talking about the Foundation for Angelman Syndrome Therapeutics, cunningly named because it it makes up the acronym FAST. So FAST created this company, Transformatics Biotherapeutics LLC, 
to take what Dr. Anderson had done and look at it with a different promoter because they were uncomfortable with that promoter because that promoter had caused health issues in other patients. I'm not going to go too far down that rabbit hole, but it was a complete non-starter. We are not going to go forward with that promoter, and it is highly unlikely, in my opinion, that the FDA would approve that promoter in the use of any medicine for somebody who's not dying. And our kids, thank God, are not dying, right? So the question is, and that promoter, by the way, was MNDU3. I share in the show notes the Transformatics press release that talks about this and the um, Fierce Pharma article where the FDA put a black box warning on every drug that had that promoter. Black box is bad. You do not want a black box warning. What's the point? The point is, Dr. Anderson came to us 2022. He said, I think there's this cool way we can help Syngapians. Help me prove it in mice. We said, that's what we want to do. So we helped him prove it in mice. And then he did it because we did our diligence and we chose a good guy and he did good work. But all of us learned in the process that the promoter was actually problematic. So now the question is, what do we do? Do we A, say, damn the torpedoes, let's try it anyway. Wrong answer. We are not going to make a medicine that we know is not going to help, that we know might hurt our kids in other ways. Do we B, redo the experiment with a different promoter and try again? Well, not so much because these things are expensive and they take time. And my position on funding new scientific approaches versus supporting the existing approaches is evolving. Or do we see, I'll come back to that, don't worry. Or do we see, sit back and wait and see what Angelman pulls off? Because guess what? We raise one to two million bucks a year. Angelman raises a lot more money than that. And they've even started a company. So they had this exact same problem we did. They funded Joe Anderson. They got, they got proof of concept that was really exciting. They saw mice get much better, but the promoter's problematic. So what they're doing right now, per the press release, is they're running the same experiments um, at UCLA, and they're going to see if they can make the same thing happen with a different promoter. If and when Angelman pulls that off, we will by all means go back to them and say, okay, let's try that promoter with Syngap. But we do not have the money right now to do extra science experiments, right? Because, Mike, what happened? We were able to fund this two years ago. We can't fund it now. What's wrong? Here's the problem, guys. T two years ago, we were still in, oh my gosh, how are we going to cure Syngap mode? There were a couple of ASOs. CHOP hadn't been announced yet. Th there was still a lot of, oh my gosh, when are we going to have drugs for our kids? We are, thank God, in such a different situation today, right? If you go to our, web if you go to our website and you go to the top right corner, I believe it is, that little, that, right next to the donate button, which I hope you're all using, and you type pipeline into the search bar, which you can get, and you go to Syngap One Related Disorder Therapeutic Pipeline, you will see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different drugs in a small molecule repurposing pipeline, right? Four of which were already in humans. You will see one, two, three, four, five different ASOs, most of which are in mice, and you will see one, two, three plus confidential, intentionally ambiguous there, three plus confidential AAV-based therapies. That is incredibly exciting, right? And then you see UC Davis, the, the Joe Anderson grant at the bottom. We don't care which of those drugs helps our kids. We love all our partners equally. All we want is a drug to help our kids. And each and every one of those drugs will fail in a clinical trial. Not because it doesn't work, but because we haven't done enough work to make sure that we can design a clinical trial well. There has not yet been a disease-modifying clinical trial of Syngap-1. What do I mean by disease-modifying? Well, we are having a clinical trial for femfluramine. We are seeing kids uh, being given Revicti by Dr. Grinspan. We, we are seeing some kids being dosed with some drugs, but what we're doing there is seeing if the symptoms get better, as opposed to delivering a therapy that makes Syngap-1 go up that would be a disease-modifying therapy. And we don't know what happens when you take a human and you give them a disease-modifying therapy and Syngap-1 goes up. So what we need to do right now, instead of taking more shots on goal and reaching in, into the scientific literature or the cutting-edge scientific labs and making other cutting-edge extra things that may work or may hit roadblocks like Dr. Anderson did, and what we need to do is say, hey, Stoke, Praxis, End, Camp 4, Quiver, Regal, End, Tevered. How can we help you think about and prepare for your clinical trial? How can we de-risk 
that clinical trial? How can we design a better clinical trial? How can we find better endpoints, better, better validated scales? How can we help you test this drug that you have so that we can run it? When you invest millions of dollars in a clinical trial, it will succeed because it was good or fail because it was bad as opposed to fail because it was good, but we had a bad clinical trial. So back to my option B on Dr. Anderson. Why aren't we just running it again with a different promoter? Because right now, SRF needs to spend every single penny that we get from you donors, every single penny investing in and preparing for clinical trials. And I will talk about this ad nauseum in a very soon podcast because I really want to focus here, right? We need to expand the CHOP clinical natural history study to other sites. We've already announced one of them will be Colorado, TBD on the other one. We need to invest more in biomarkers. This, is, this work is ongoing. Again, we'll talk about it. We need to invest in validated scales. This is what's happening with Orca and Dr. Frazier, right? We need to think about EEG biomarkers. Go watch our last scientific meeting, a couple of great presentations. We need to understand clinical trials. And what I am saying to everybody who comes to me with another bright, shiny idea is, that's great, put it on the list. I need to raise a couple of million dollars and we need to make sure that we are pushing as far and as fast as we can on clinical trial readiness. And that is the story today of three grants. What are, what are the takeaways? Takeaway one, it, we're done with new science. We're, or let me say that differently. I want to put new science on hold. I want to focus on clinical medicine right now, clinical research, and, and getting therapies and or drugs and or repurposed drugs into humans and showing that they work. That's priority one. Let's, and on that point, let's talk about the uh, clinical trial network. END is still recruiting. If you have been to END, they want to see you every six months. This is important. They want to understand how this disease evolves. Please go to END. SRF does have travel support. If, if the cost is a problem, please go to END. Similarly, the webinar for Dr. Abbott um, was supposed to be today. Unfortunately, it was postponed because Dr. Abbott is... is um, tied up with something right now, but she will do that webinar soon. And we are excited to tell you more about Colorado. If you're anywhere near Colorado and you want to sign up for that uh, natural history study there, which is in close partnership with CHOP, the data will be shared, etc. Please reach out to Lauren Perry on our side. Lauren, as you know, is based in Colorado. She is, she is connecting the dots there. Lauren at KirstenGap1.org. Similarly, I want to remind you, and I've said this before, Stanford is also seeing patients. If you're in California, please consider going and seeing Dr. Um, Juliet Knowles and Dr. Christopher Lee Messer at Stanford. I know them both. They are excellent humans. They take care of our kids beautifully well. Please go and see them if you're if you're California based. Okay, I'm going to blow through a couple other things here. I announced last week the Missense account of the fund, and then I, I celebrated Emmy's fundraiser. Missense account is at 10k. Emmy's fundraiser is at 5k. Please support those links are in the show notes, or and or start your own fundraiser. SRF needs to raise a lot of money to push forward this clinical medicine calendar management. Rare across America is in 24 days. Registration ends in 10 days. Our conference, as a reminder, is in 146 days at the Omni in LA on December 5th and 6th. If you are a Syngap family, you have to go to the conference. You have to go to the conference. You're going to meet new friends. You're going to see old friends. You're going to see Syngapians. You're going to learn so much. It is life-changing, guys. Got to go to the conference, December 5th and 6th in LA. Please go and register. The room block will be up shortly, but get, get your registration in. Also, as a reminder, we are doing... Um, Blood draws through our various friends in the rare disease community. STXBP1 has a conference in Philly, July 19th through 21st. Myra Syndrome has a conference in Philly, July 27th through 28th. So both later this month, if you are in Philly, please, and you haven't given blood to the SRF Biobank, please go to that conference. Make sure your blood gets collected into the Biobank. Reach out to us at info at curasingap1.org. We will set you up. We will get you registered. The, uh, the HNRNPH2 conference is in Seattle. Also, the last weekend of July, please go to that if you're in Seattle. Make sure we get your sample. PWS and USP7, hi, Bo, are in Atlanta in late September. This is all in the show notes. Please go, uh, if you're in Atlanta, make sure we collect your sample. Combined Brainies are in conference in Kansas City, of all places, on September 29th. Go there. And if you miss all of that, you can also give samples at our conference, December 5th and 6th in LA. But the sooner you get the samples into the biobank, the better. These samples are used by um, industry partners and researchers to do a variety of things. 
This is the end of this episode. If you are newly diagnosed, syngap.fun slash resources, we are here for you. Reach out to us, connect with us, get on the phone with us. This is an overwhelming diagnosis, but we're here for you. There is a powerful community. The Syngap Research Fund community is here to support you and help you advance the future, improve, I should say, the future for people living with Syngap 1 related disorders. Social media matters, you guys. We're all on social media. Please make sure you connect with and follow Syngap Research Fund at, at CureSyngap1 on all channels. This is important. This is how probably how you found us. This is how the next family will find us. So I want you to subscribe or follow us. I want you to like us. I want you to go through our content. I want you to share it to your friends and your family. Make sure you share this podcast to your friends and your family. It's really hard to talk about Syngap, right? But if you share this these episodes with your family, your p- parents will call you and they'll say two things. They'll be like, wow, Mike's crazy. Yeah, he's crazy, but he's the best we got. Okay, fine. And wh- I didn't know this about Syngap. I didn't know that about Syngap. Or what's he talking Talking about what I don't understand what a lentiviral vector is. Doesn't matter. It's too exhausting to tell everybody everything about Syngap, which is one of the reasons I, I spend so much time and effort on these podcasts, so that you can share the YouTube video with friends, family, colleagues, grandmas, grandpas, whatever. Tell people about Syngap, but don't put yourself to the work of explaining this. That's why I do this podcast. Just share these episodes. YouTube, we have 1,050 followers. LinkedIn, 3,685. Twitter, 10,724. Instagram, TikTok too. We have also have those channels, I guess. We are everywhere, guys. Subscribe, share, like, amplify our content. Help other families find the Syngap Research Fund and make sure you like and subscribe to this podcast. Thank you for listening. I am grateful for your support. We could not do this without your donations. Please, if you have not donated, donate. If you have not started a fundraiser for the Syngap Research Fund, everything I just talked about costs real money, guys. All these grants years ago that are still bearing fruit and still helping us understand Syngap, they happen because people like you raised money and gave money. Thank you in advance for your support. We are making the future better for all of our children.